الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه استن بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Certain times of the year, whether they be certain days or certain weeks or certain months of the year, are given special importance because of certain events that took place at those times in history. And so this is general across all people, all civilizations, and so everyone, every nation, every civilization, they commemorate certain days because of certain historical, important historical events that took place. And so if we are in the month of Ramadan, and this is a special time of the year, the question we need to ask is, what is it that made Ramadan so special? What event was so important that made this time of the year special? Yes. And so many people, they think that Ramadan is special because it is a month of fasting. And without a doubt, fasting is important. It is one of the pillars of Islam. But the reality is that it's the opposite. Ramadan was chosen to be the month of fasting because of something else. And that was the revelation of the Quran. The revelation of the Quran is what made Ramadan important. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. And then Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ You know, Allah talks about the Qur'an being revealed in Ramadan. Then He says, whoever witnesses that month, then let him fast. So all of this shows us that Allah made fasting this particular month and not any other month of the year because of the importance of the month because it was the month in which the quran was revealed now what does it mean that the quran was revealed in ramadan what does that mean exactly it means the first revelation the quran began to be revealed to the prophet ﷺ in the month of ramadan and specifically fi laylatul qadr we revealed it in Laylatul Qadr. In another ayah, we revealed it in a blessed night, and that is that is Laylatul Qadr, which is in Ramadan. And then after that, the Quran was revealed gradually, right? Over a period of 23 years until the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Now think about it. The revelation started to come to the Prophet ﷺ in the cave of Hira, as we know. How many years before the Hijrah? From the beginning of the revelation until the Hijrah, how many years was that? 13. So from the beginning of the prophethood, until Hijrah to Medina, that's 13 years. When was fasting Ramadan made obligatory? When, when did this become legislated? In which year? In the second year of the Hijrah. 
in the second year of the Hijrah. So that means 15 years, 15 years, the Muslims did not fast Ramadan. But they knew it was an important month. They knew it was a special time of the year. It was the month in which the Quran was revealed. And so it is for this reason that the Prophet Wasallam would give special attention to the Quran in this month. And so as we have in the hadith of Fatima radiallahu anha, she says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told her that every year Jibreel used to revise the Quran with me once. But this year, and she was talking about the year before his death, the year in which he passed away, Jibreel came and revised it with him twice. In another hadith, in uh, narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous of people. And he was the most generous in Ramadan. When Jibreel would come and meet him, and he would meet him every night, revising the Quran in Ramadan. So we can see here, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would spend Ramadan with the Qur'an. And then we see that the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, they did the same. And so they would pray Taraweeh. And we would find in many different narrations, it's mentioned that they would recite long surahs. Surahs that had more than a hundred ayat in their taraweeh. And basically, taraweeh, they would pray individually until the time of Umar radiallahu an, when he noticed that everyone is praying individually. So let us get them all together and pray behind one imam. And so he chose, who did he choose to, to be the Imam to lead the Muslims in Taraweeh? Which Sahabi received that honor? It was Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu. And so he was the most well versed in the Quran. And then if we look at the Tabi'oon and the Atba'a Tabi'oon, we find the same pattern. That basically, they understood that Ramadan was a time to connect with the Qur'an and to give it special attention. And so it's mentioned that Imam Malik, for example, when Ramadan would come, he would close all other books. The books of hadith, the books of fiqh. He would close them and only and only open up the book of Allah. Likewise, we find Imam Zuhri, he would say, when Ramadan would come, there are only two things to do now. Qira'atul Qur'an wa it'am al ta'am. To recite the Qur'an and feed, feed people with food. And if we look at the lives of the Salaf and also those who follow them, we find that they wouldn't only recite the Qur'an once, or even twice, or even three times in the month of Ramadan, but multiple times. And so we have the example of Qatada, rahimahullah. He would normally finish the Qur'an every seven days. When Ramadan would come, he would finish it every three days. And then in the last ten nights, 
he would finish it every night. Imam al-Shafi'i, he would finish, he would finish the Qur'an, he would finish it, it is mentioned 60 times in Ramadan. 60 times. That means basically, what does that mean? That means two khatmas every day. He would finish the Qur'an twice a day. Now, some of us, we may find this to be impossible. But when we compare it to our lives, if we were to compare our lives to theirs, we see the reason why they were able to do it and why we are not able to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in their time and in their lives. Why? Because they were sincere. Because they had devoted their time to Allah. They were serious. They devoted their time to Allah. Whereas, if we look at our own lives today, we find that our lives are devoted to serving ourselves. and our personal pleasures and desires. And so when all your time is going to, you know, yourself, then when are you gonna uh, find time for Allah? But the Salaf, we're not like that. And that's why we find these examples, one after the other. And we think it's impossible, but they were human beings like us. What's the difference? The difference was their iman and their ikhlas and their devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point here is that we need to give the Qur'an its due right. And it's unfortunate that, that many of us have little to no connection at all with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in general in our lives. Some of us we don't open up the Mus'haf until Ramadan comes. Even though the Qur'an is the source of all good, the source of happiness. And we all know this. But still we turn away from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what good, what barakah do we expect in our lives when you know, we have forsaken the key to all good and barakah, and that is, that is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes those who recite the Qur'an. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةِ وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً Those who recite the book of Allah and they establish their salah and they spend of their wealth both in secret and openly these people they hope for an exchange with Allah that will never perish And so their time and their devotion to Allah by spending you know, their time reciting the Qur'an, they don't look at it as time gone to waste. They don't look at it like that. But rather, they look at it as time that was invested and they will reap the fruit of that on the Day of Judgment. It's as if they're going into a transaction with Allah. That, oh Allah, in exchange for this, this is what you're going to give me. And that is the profit that is guaranteed. Now, 
we need to take the Quran seriously and spend time with it this month of Ramadan. As we mentioned earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to reveal the Quran in this month. And as we can see from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba and you know, their followers, they would give time to the Quran, the book of Allah in the month of Ramadan. And we need to do this so that it continues with us for the rest of the year. And so just like fasting is meant to train us to attain the taqwa of Allah so that it lasts with us even after Ramadan, likewise should be our relationship with the Qur'an. That Ramadan is not just the time to read the Qur'an and then put it away. But rather, we want to take this opportunity of starting now and then continuing, you know, allowing the Qur'an to continue with us even after Ramadan. Until we become, you know, companions of the Qur'an. Until we become companions of the Qur'an. Ashab al-Qur'an. And, you know, if we look at various ahadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he refers to, to these people as being companions of the Qur'an. Not just those who, you know, every now and then they'll pick up the Qur'an and read it. No. Those who have such an attachment with the Qur'an that it is with them wherever they go. Reciting it, memorizing it, understanding its meanings, reflecting over it, tadabbur of the Qur'an, reflecting over these meanings. And then above all of that, implementing its teachings in their lives. Those who have this relationship with the Qur'an, they're known as the companions of the Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, for example, in one hadith, يُقَالُوا لِصَاحِبِ Quran. It will be said to the companion of the Qur'an, اِقْرَأْ وَارْتَقِي وَرَتِّلْ كَمَا كُنْتَ تُرَتِّلْ فِي الدُّنْيَا Recite. On the Day of Judgment, it will be said to the companion of the Qur'an, recite. Recite and rise. Move up in the levels of Jannah. Recite beautifully like you used to do in the dunya. Your home will be in the last ayah that you recite. Keep on going up in levels in Jannah and your place will be the last ayah that you used to recite or that you will recite. In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, اِقْرَأُوا الْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَفِيعًا لِأَصْحَابِهِ Recite the Qur'an for it will come on the Day of Judgment as an intercessor for the one who used to recite it. لِأَصْحَابِهِ for its companions. Again, look at how the Prophet ﷺ referred to those who had this connection with the Qur'an. He refers to them as companions of the Qur'an. You know, just like your friend, your buddy that you're around with at all times. For these people, that is the Qur'an. With them at all times, wherever they go. And so, this being the month of Ramadan, we need to, you know, give the Qur'an its due right. And we need to make a strong attempt at reciting the Qur'an 
as much as we can until we finish it. You know, here I'm not talking about two or three times or four times or five times. I'm saying at least once. At least once. The bare minimum that a Muslim should do is that they should recite the Quran from beginning to end once at least. And so in order to do that, first of all, have the firm intention and determination that this year you're going to do it. And you're going to devote your time to it. And don't become intimidated. Don't become intimidated thinking that you know, I'm not able to recite properly. I'm slow. Arabic is not my native tongue. You know, these are all whisperings of shaitan. Try your best. And remember, as the Prophet wasallam told us, the great rewards for reciting. That for every letter that we recite, we get how many rewards? How many hasanat? Ten. And then just to clear any confusion that might come in the minds of some people, he clarified that. And so he said, when I say one harf is ten, I don't mean alif la mean. That's not one harf, that's not one letter. But alif is one letter, lam is one letter, and mim is one letter. Just by reciting alif la mim, you get 30 hasanat. And then imagine how many hasanat you would get if you were to recite the entire Quran from beginning to end. According to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, there are 323,000 671 letters in the Quran. How many? 321, uh, 323,671 letters. Multiply that by 10 and how many hasanat do you get? How many? 3.2 million. Now imagine that, 3.2 million hasanat. That these are hasanat that are easy, but we need to make sure that we do it properly. Recite the Quran properly. Make your intention solely for the sake of Allah. Otherwise, all of that will go to waste if you do it for others. If you do it for others. Also remind yourself of the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us that whoever recites the Qur'an fluently, he will be with the special angels who are basically the honorable and obedient scribes. And then he ﷺ said, he who recites the Qur'an while finding it difficult, struggling with it, the, uh, but he does his best, he tries his best, then for him is a double reward. For him is a double reward. So imagine that. What did we just say? 3.2 million hasanat for someone who recites the Quran. From beginning to end. If you find it difficult and you struggle with it, then you're going to get more than 6 million hasanat. And that's a bare minimum. Otherwise, the rewards of Allah are without limit. And Allah multiplies for whomever He wills. Depending on what's in the heart, the sincerity and you know, the hard effort that someone is putting into it. And so this is the first point. The second point, what will help you to devote your time to the Qur'an this Ramadan is by removing all distractions. By removing all distractions. And, you know, choosing times to sit down with the Qur'an when you won't have any distractions around you. And this starts with our phones and social media. If we truly want to benefit from our time and recite the Qur'an, then we need to remove all of these distractions.
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك